guys. Welcome to The Catholic Shepherd. This is our special edition issue. My name is Rick DeSanctis, and today I have a very special guest here with uh, us today here on The Catholic Shepherd. His name is Roy Showman. Happens to be a Jewish friend of mine who I met a few months ago who became a Catholic. Get that. He also was a Harvard professor. I'm going to let him tell you everything because I could carry on as we know. Um, he came to realize the truth, and he came into the Catholic Church, I think it was, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. Again, he can tell you that. Um, but he has a couple of books that he's written. He lives in the other part of the United States. He wound up in my world by chance, or I will say by blessing. And uh, I can't wait for the show today. But as always, I want to start off by reminding you that this is the Catholic Catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It is a giant book, and it is filled with all kinds of stuff about the Catholic Church and the teaching of the Church and what has gone on through the years at councils. And, uh, you know, and during this day and age, people are always arguing that what's right and what's wrong and how do we know and where do we go and do we, do we listen to the Pope? Is the Pope infallible? And is the magisterium the final word? Well, you know, we tend to kind of go in that direction. Yes, we kind of want to go with the magisterium and the teaching of the Church. But when the Church speaks, she can only speak the truth of the faith. In this book, you can find out all the questions that you may have, whatever they may be. If they're large, if they're small, if uh, you're wondering what's happening inside the church and why we do what we do, you go to the catechism. Why do I bring this up every time? Because in this day and age, we're in turbulence. It's, not, it's nothing new, but it's something that we need to pay attention to. Where do we go? Where do we find truth? You know, how do we know what the truth is? Well, we have the catechism. It's not the Bible. However, there, it is filled with biblical writings. It's filled with uh, writers, church fathers, and whatnot, and councils. So make sure you check this out. Get yourself a copy of the Catholic Catechism. Yes, it's a very big book. Don't treat it as a novel. Go to the back, look at the index, and you'll find out everything you need to know. So guys, enough about me. I can't wait to get to this guest. His name is Roy Showman. We'll be right back. Thank you, guys. <laughs> just here at the mall, uh, but all across uh, Peabody. Welcome back to the Catholic Shepherd. Hope you enjoyed that brief little interlude in our monologue. Um, today, I am super excited. I said that earlier. I have with me today Mr. Roy showman and he is a Jew who became a Catholic man who um, was also a Harvard professor. He has a couple of books which we'll get into and um, he's all over the place but why I bring this up is about a month, couple of months ago I personally was feeling stale in my faith. So I went onto YouTube and for whatever reason I typed in Catholic conversion or whatever and I had heard of this guy Roy before and he pops up. So I watch his story, and I am blown away by it. Pretty much changed the rest of my season, no joke. I'm showing everyone. From there, I decided to put out the Catholic newspaper again, which you can see behind me, which we'll show you after. Also, I ended up doing this Catholic Shepherd TV show. Well, as God would have it, I walked into a church one day, and while I'm in the church, I get down before my knees before the Blessed Sacrament. I say a prayer, and I look to my left... And there is Roy Showman. Roy Showman is sitting in the pew at the Carmelite Chapel. And I said, can I take you out to lunch? He said, well, it's kind of ironic. I'm only home for a day. Um, how about tomorrow? We went. We sat down. We had lunch. And now I am super grateful to this guy for coming here today and uh, being on the show. So I'd like to welcome Mr. Thanks. Roy Showman. I always say Schumann. I get it wrong, but it's Showman, correct? That's right. All right. So I'm going to start at the beginning, like I said in my last few episodes, and pretend that I'm Marcus Grodi from EWTN, which I'm not. I'm nothing like uh, Marcus Grodi. But I want you to kind of share your story, and then we'll kind of get into it after if we have time. Um, if I have some questions, which I'm sure I will. So, um, Roy Showman, how are you doing? Doing great. Awesome. Um, okay, start at the beginning. Let's start at the beginning. Um, I'll step right out of the way. It's, it's a kind of a tongue-twisting kind of a problem, what, what I am. I know you said I'm a Jew. I don't mind that at all. Yeah. Uh, I consider myself a Jew in the Catholic Church. 
uh, I don't think that I stopped being Jewish. If I was Jewish before I became a follower of the Jewish Messiah, who is Jesus, why should becoming a follower of the Jewish Messiah make me less Jewish? It should make me more Jewish. And yet I'm in the Catholic Church. So I figure I have to call myself or consider myself at least a Jew in the Catholic Church. Um, I uh, didn't start out that way, of course. I started out a um, unenlightened Jew. I don't want to offend anybody, but um, a Jew who didn't realize that the Messiah already came. My parents were both the German Jewish Holocaust refugees. I grew up outside of New York City. And um, they had both f basically fled, fled uh, Hitler's Germany and made it to the United States. Uh, where they met and married. Uh, I had grew up in a very Jewish world. Um, the town we lived in, in fact, in those days, was the only town in the area that allowed Jews to buy a house. Uh, towns were called restricted, meaning that, that Jews couldn't, I suppose they could live there, but they couldn't buy a house there. Uh, all my parents' friends were Jewish. All my friends were Jewish. I went to Jewish religious education from the beginning of uh, school, from first grade until university alongside secular education. Uh, the, some, actually, in my late high school years, I became even more enthusiastically or fanatically Jewish. I was always very God-oriented, had a tremendous thirst to know God. I'm going to start my first digression already, which is, um, boy, I, I, I mean, I would have been on cloud nine if I had any idea that God could ever be as accessible as he is uh, through Jesus and in particular through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. I mean, I was dying just to know the littlest sliver of truth about God or the slightest um, hint of a relationship with God. And what's available through the sacraments is absolutely mind-blowing. And since you start the show with a plug for the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, as a child growing up, I would have given my right arm just to know the answers, the answers to the questions that bother every human soul, right? Uh, what's the purpose of life? What happens after we die? How do you please God? Why did God make us? What does God want from us? And so forth. Those are answers, uh, questions, frankly, that Judaism doesn't have the answer to. They're all there in black and white in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, I'll actually be a little bit uh, on PC and say, in a, some ways, the old catechism of the Catholic Church, the Penny Catechism, mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called the Baltimore Catechism, that's, or I think it's uh, designed for a seven-year-old to start reading it, is even that, I mean, I mean, I would have, you know, as I said, given my right arm to know those answers, and they're right there in black and white. But anyway, I didn't, but I was kind of hungry for God, and so late in high school, I became a follower of a Hasidic rabbi, the Hasids with the long ear curls, and um, he was uh, Shlomo Karlobach. He had a kind of an outreach to not exactly fallen away Jews, but to non-Hasidic Jews, trying to bring them into a deeper spirituality. And I became a follower of his and spent the summer between high school and university in his entourage, following him around and going to his prayer meetings every night and so forth. And uh, I went to Israel with him and tr was doing this in Israel with him that summer and uh, even considered not returning to the United States to begin university, but staying in Israel and entering the closest thing that Judaism has to religious life, which is a life of uh, study and prayer in a yeshiva in Jerusalem. But I didn't. I returned to the United States. I began university, MIT. You might have heard of it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I uh, lost my faith there. I lost my belief in God there under the influence of the ex incredibly arrogant and falsely scientific view that religion is just some kind of a superstition that man came up with to pretend to have the answers to what science would later give him all the real answers to. Um, and I bought that kind of hook, line, and sinker. Uh, but it actually is the opposite of a scientific worldview because the essence of science is you start with the data, you look at the evidence, you form a theory that can explain the evidence. If it's successful in explaining the data, you can keep that theory, and if not, you have to throw it out and come up with a theory that can explain the data, the evidence. And in fact, materialism, so to speak, that there is nothing beyond the physical world that we see, fails miserably in explaining the data. And um, uh, we can think of, as Catholics, we can think of 
a number of uh, physically verifiable miracles, many, 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 actually countless ones, that there is physical evidence for that cannot be explained by materialism. We have the Shroud of Turin, which was the burial cloth, believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus, that uh, bears a miraculously produced imprint of a crucified man um, on the cloth with no pigment, with no, um, no physical explanation of how the image got there, and which even today, in 2019, couldn't be counterfeited with all of our technology today. And yet, it has been absolutely, uh, the provenance has been known since the 13th century. In other words, they would have had it counterfeited in the 13th century right. at the very latest, and yet, even today, we couldn't counterfeit it. The miracle of the sun at Lourdes, where the sun spun in the sky and fell to earth, witnessed by 80 to 100,000, including skeptics, including atheists. In fact, Portugal at the time was under a communist government. So there was a tremendous effort to uh, debunk the Catholic faith. And the uh, uh, newspaper, the main newspaper of Lisbon, which is a communist paper, I think it was actually called O Seculo, you know, it was very secular, mm. sent a reporter out to Fatima when the miracle was supposed to happen because the young visionaries had been told when this great miracle would happen. And the word spread. So this reporter came out from the Lisbon newspaper to make fun of the ignorant peasants who had all assembled to see a miracle, which of course would never occur. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only did the miracle occur and was witnessed by everyone there, but it was witnessed by the reporter who was kind of in a quandary because he wanted to just make fun of this superstition, but in fact he admitted what he saw. And so he sent a kind of uh, dispatch back to the newspaper, which is a little bit um, it was trying to be mocking, but it admitted that it had happened. And when he returned to Lisbon, he was fired on the spot because mm, <laughs> it, sure, yeah. it didn't conform to what they wanted. Um, and the medical miracles at Lourdes, I could go on and on and right, on. Right. Uh, the Tilma of Guadalupe, I know that, uh, I hope that many of your viewers are not Catholic. I think most Catholics know about those physical miracles. Yeah, well, I have to be honest with you. As a Catholic, I never paid much attention to it until I saw your show. Um, not that I was putting it down, I just had always looked at Our Lady of Guadalupe as another miracle, and I wasn't basing my faith on it. But because of that, I have been studying, which kind of led me back to you, and uh, a lot of other, uh, other little uh, weird things have happened since then. So uh, continue, yeah. didn't mean to interrupt. No, please interrupt. Mm. Um, I would say it's not a matter, it shouldn't be a matter of basing one's faith on it, so to speak. Um, but at the same time, if you want to have a scientific attitude, you have to come up with a hypothesis that can explain physical evidence. Right. And that's a challenge. If you want to dismiss faith entirely, if you want to dismiss the supernatural or the spiritual entirely, it's quite a challenge to come up with a hypothesis. Basically, what you have to say is that um, every witness is lying, every scientific measurement, the people reporting it is lying, and so forth, and it's, it's just um, kind of incredible. I mean, it's unsustainable is what I mean by incredible. Sure. Uh, the, um, I'm going, well, I'll get back to the mainstream. Um, I'm actually friends with a Jewish man who's not in the Catholic Church, who's still completely Jewish, so mm -hmm. to speak, named Barry Schwartz, who it was the official scientific photographer for the Shroud of Turin project. There was a time, I think it was in the 80s, when the people who control the Shroud of Turin allowed a team of scientists from Jet Propulsion Laboratory yeah, yeah to uh, go to the shroud to make scientific tests, to make scientific photographs and so forth. And um, they consciously did not allow the team to be, I think, more than one-third Catholic. Mm. Um, and uh, they wanted to make sure they had atheists and Jews and so forth on the team because mm. they didn't want to be biased. Yeah, yeah, so this sense. Jewish photographer, scientific photographer, he was just doing the scientific photographs. But basically, you know, he now runs around um, you know, giving conferences and stuff, there is, there is absolutely no um, non-supernatural explanation for, mm -hmm. the, for the image on the shroud. Um, and I'll give a little plug, it's, I hope it isn't a, a sales plug, but I do have a radio show and I have a two-hour interview actually with Barry Schwartz mm. that's up on the, uh, on my, I have a website, salvationsfromthejews.com, and I have the past episodes of that radio show on and uh, you can listen to this 
very Jewish guy, sounds like Woody Allen, Jewish accent, <laughs> just describing the problem with explaining away the Shroud of Turin, right. the image on the Shroud of Turin. Anyway, so all of this is, that's all by way of saying that the MIT uh, strictly materialistic worldview is actually not scientific. It's the violation of science, right. but nonetheless, I bought into it. By the time I got out of university, I was uh, atheist, essentially. And I went on to Harvard Business School. I did well enough there that they invited me back to join the faculty shortly after graduation. And so I found myself on the faculty of Harvard Business School as a newly minted professor of marketing. Marketing, man after my own heart. Uh, professor of marketing, right. not not uh, right. Okay, <laughs> uh, not an effective marketer, probably. But um, but uh, you know what they say: those who can do, those who can't teach. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> teach. <yeah. laughs> but anyway, uh, at the age of twenty-nine, and that's really where my witness testimony itself begins. Because what happened was, as I mentioned, since I was a small child, I had this tremendous hunger for God, and um, hunger to know the meaning of life. And I honestly thought that at my bar mitzvah, which is when the child is 13, it's a lot like the Catholic confirmation, the uh, curtain would disappear and I would enter into a personal relationship with God at my bar mitzvah, which is a ceremony in the synagogue where the child becomes religiously an adult. And when that didn't happen, it was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. But then pretty soon I decided the meaning of life would come when I got a driver's license. Mm -hmm or um, when I began university, or if I got into Harvard Business School, or when I began my career and so forth. But here I was already more successful in my worldly career than I ever expected to be, but life still had no meaning or purpose. We're just a chemical accident, a bolt of lightning hit a puddle of amino acids five billion years ago, and eventually we crawled out and here we are. There's no pattern or meaning or purpose to life. Um, we live for 70, 80, 90 years, we die, and that's it. Um, nothing makes any sense, actually. And there, I mean, it was uh, it really, um, it was a total antithesis of uh, meaning of life. I mean, it was like made a mockery of mm -hmm. life having a meaning. And so I fell into the um, darkest despair of my life at that point. Because what was different was at this point, there was nothing more I could imagine might happen in the future which could give my life meaning. Because as I said, I was already, um, I had gotten all the brass rings that were out there to get. So I, in that despair, I was walking in nature early one morning, which is the only place where I could find comfort in those days. It was, it was in like um, the low pine woods, the scrubby pine woods behind the dunes in Cape Cod in one of the national seashore parks. And it was early in the morning before there were any people around. And um, I received the most spectacular grace of my life. I was walking along, lost in my thoughts, and I had long since abandoned any hope of there being a God or anything like that. When, um, from one moment to the next, the veil between earth and heaven disappeared, and I found myself in the presence of God, in a very uh, intimate communication with God, and seeing my life as I would see it after I died, looking back over my life in the presence of God. And I understood everything as I would after I died in the presence of God. And I saw everything I would be happy about and everything I would wish I had done differently. I saw that my two greatest regrets when I died would be, number one, all of the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence I was uh, in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist, coming from an all-knowing, all-loving God. And the other great regret would be every hour I had wasted doing nothing of value in the eyes of heaven. I saw that uh, we live forever. I saw that every action has a moral content that's observed and weighed in the balance and recorded for all eternity. And that uh, here I had been so worried about life having no meaning when in fact, Every moment has the potential for an action of value in the eyes of heaven, even if it's throwing up a short prayer, or certainly sure. doing any good, or, or um, and so forth. Um, and if we take advantage of that opportunity, we would very literally be rewarded for all eternity for that. And every opportunity that we let go by and don't take advantage of would be a lost opportunity for all eternity. 
Now, remember, I was a Harvard Business School marketing professor at the time, and everything is net present value and maximizing returns and, and so forth. And I uh, realized how stupid I had been because I had been putting all my time and energy into accumulating things which wouldn't do me any good at all, even 100 years later after I was dead. And if I wanted to be uh, intelligently selfish, smart and selfish, I would put all my time and energy into building up treasure in heaven, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, the image that flashed across in my mind was of a child uh, playing Monopoly and greedily accumulating this big pile of brightly colored paper Monopoly money when right next to it was a huge stack of gold coins he was ignoring. And that's the case, obviously. Mm -hmm. That was the situation I found myself in. Um, the most profoundly affecting aspect of this experience was coming into the um, full and total and intimate knowledge of um, God's very, very personal love for me, that not only did he know me by name, which I was more than I could ever imagine as a Jew, that God, the God who created the universe, that God who created existence itself should know who Roy Shoman was, was mm. absolutely inconceivable. But not only did he know me by name, not only did he arrange and control absolutely everything that had ever happened to me, but he was paying attention to me and knew how I felt at every moment uh, so deeply that in a very real sense, everything that made me happy made him happy and everything that made me sad made him sad. And coming into that knowledge that the God creator of the universe was paying that kind of attention to me and do doting over me actually as though I were the only creature he had ever created was by far the most revolutionary aspect of this experience. Do you think that God reaches out to other people like that? I mean, what, why do you think he kind of popped into your life at that point? Why would it be you? And I know we've talked about this before. You were just an innocent bystander. But at that moment, was it because you were seeking? Is this I, first of all, I just want to correct any misconceptions anyone might okay. have to the answer to the question, which is um, whatever was particular about me receiving this grace of, of this um, uh, uh, theophany, of this experience of God, there's nothing particular to me about that personal love that God has for me. That's universal sure. and that's incomprehensible. But the reason I tell the story is that it applies to everybody, that, that God dotes on everybody like that and is intimately involved and yearning for the love of everybody like that. So I don't want anything I say to actually no, no. I'm make just anything particular about yeah. that aspect of it. After seeing your first video, I was just taken by that, thinking to myself, Wow, like that must have been a powerful experience. And I think I said to you an experience, and you said it wasn't an experience. Uh, maybe I didn't say experience. Was it uh, something to the effect of uh, a moment? I don't know. You corrected me, I though. Mean, we I had don't know lunch. what you said. Uh, yeah. Whether you said, you know, apparition. Something or, like And you're yeah. like, no, it's more of... It definitely was an experience. Yeah. It wasn't... I, I don't know if I'd call it an apparition, because yeah. it's like I fell into heaven. It's not like God right, right, fell right. into earth, so right. to speak. Um, and as to why it happened, uh, I leave, I mean, you're going to have to ask God, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, I did definitely have a tremendous yearning and thirst for God, um, which I had given up on because I had given up on hoping that God existed. But um, I definitely, on some level of my being, had that thirst, um, even if I denied it on the surface. Uh, there are two, two other converts that I could mention uh, because I, I think it's actually dogma. You can probably find it in here if you know what page to go to. There you go. That, um, that God wants to make himself known. God wants to reveal the truth to every human being. God certainly wants um, all men, now you have to say all people or God forbid all human beings. Don't go there. That's what men used yeah, to mean. But right wants all human souls to end up in heaven, that God gives every human soul the necessary grace to get to heaven. That's definitely in the Catechism. And it's also, by the way, straight in the, in the New Testament. Um, and the only thing that limits his reaching out and doing whatever is necessary to get us to heaven is our contrary free will. He respects our free will. You know that, that um, poster or image you sometimes see of Jesus uh, knocking on the door 
uh, and you know, knocking to be let in, and it's up to us to let him in or not. The only thing that keeps him from um, revealing himself to us is our unwillingness to receive him. And uh, so I, I know a Jewish woman who's now a very enthusiastic Catholic woman, so to speak, in the Catholic Church. She's actually a philosophy professor, Rhonda Chervin. And um, I'm going all over the map, but that's okay. Go You're for a it. Go host. for it. Uh, her story, I have two books, which uh, uh, is one of the reasons you invited yeah. me on, and one of the reasons I have this um, apostolate. And uh, one of them is uh, Honey from the Rock, 16 Jews Find the Sweetness of Christ. And Rhonda Chervin, who's still alive, uh, her witness testimony is in there. But what happened to her was she started saying a prayer, God, if you exist, save my soul if I have a soul. And that was enough. Mm. That was enough for um, she to receive a, 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 not exactly an apparition of, of Jesus, but she was looking at a painting of Jesus, and he came to life in the painting. Wow. I actually know another Jewish woman. Uh, she's now elderly in, in London. Same thing happened, that um, on the coffee table at a place where she was staying, there was a, a picture of Jesus, and it came to life, and that ended up bringing mm. her into the Catholic Church. So it doesn't take much. Uh, Charles de Foucault, who's a Catholic saint, um, his prayer was, God, if you exist, I have to know. Mm. And that was enough for God to make himself known. So uh, he doesn't take, it doesn't take much right. for him to break down the door. So let me ask you a question. So I happen to be friends with an awful lot of non-Catholics of all denominations, Jews, um, Episcopalians, whatever. Is it wrong of me or someone to talk about our faith? You don't want to insult anybody. I heard in one of your videos you said it's actually we're doing people a disservice to not share it. You wish people had shared with you. Maybe I'm not saying that correctly. Um, should we be sharing and, you know, how do we share and where do we go from there? Where do I go from there to, to inspire people to know the truth or what we believe to be I the truth? I think you should get like a TV show. Maybe you know what, that's a good idea, like the Catholic access. Shepherd maybe? Yeah. Go to a local town, maybe see if they'll uh, give me Maybe put out a newspaper. That's a great idea. Um, Glad <laughs> I thought of it. Yeah, you should be in marketing, you know, you'd think <laughs> of these things. Yeah, funny guy. <laughs> um, I, um, the, the problem is one has to um, put some detail behind the words because words like evangelization mm. or, or um, sharing the faith and so forth, it covered a wide range of activities and and uh, one probably has to be a little bit more more uh, exact in, in, in you know if you want to give a recommendation in, in at college at MIT uh, there was one one young man in my class who was an observant Catholic from a devout Catholic family his name was Steve his first name I was dying to be his roommate mm -hmm. I moved heaven and earth to be assigned to be his roommate. I had total contempt for the Catholic Church. I had total contempt for him and his devoutness and all of that stuff. Us foolish Catholics, we were all foolish at the time, correct? Um, but he had a sunniness and a joy that none of my neurotic Woody Allen New York Jewish friends had, you know, and I, which I wanted to be around. And uh, I went out to his house. He grew up on a farm in Iowa. And he took me out there, I don't know, Thanksgiving break or one of the breaks. And his family, very Catholic, never would dream of missing Sunday Mass. Father had thought of being a priest for a while, but he became a farmer or stayed as a farmer. Um, I was like so moved, I don't know what to say, but, you know, in a way it was like in heaven on earth. Just their, their kindness, their gentleness, their lack of neuroticness, you know, their faith. Uh, they never proselytized me. Um, they did. Uh, they did. The, f the whole family had to go to church on Sundays, and I don't know if it was a matter of transportation. I don't remember whether I got out of the car and went to church, but I was in the car with them mm -hmm. going to church, and I I spent the time singing a uh, song mocking the Catholic Church. I don't know if anyone knows Tom Lehrer, but he used I to be a, a comic yeah. songwriter, and <laughs> it was called. The Vatican rag, and it was it was like it was a mockery. It was like a Monty Python thing, right, right. making fun of the Catholic Church. I'm so that was my up. rebelliousness against this family, and they didn't react. I mean, they they kept probably a stony silence, yeah. but it's not like they yelled at me. It's not like they kicked me out of the car. That was evangelization, you know, their kindness, their gentleness, or whatever. So, 
Definitely, I think, um, you know, at the very least, one is very useful to let people know what you have in your, first of all, if you're not Catholic, but if you're some other form of Christian, uh, let people know what you have in your relationship with Jesus. Let people know what Jesus means to you. Let people know um, what you think or what you hope is waiting for you after death and so forth. If you're Catholic, let them know what going to Mass means to you, what receiving the Eucharist means to you, what saying the Rosary means to you, what going to confession means to you. When it comes up, just let them know. And you're not right. telling them, you know, you'll go to hell if you don't go to, you know, become, enter the Catholic Church. Right, right. But you're just letting them know, they're letting, letting them see the light shine in you and know that that light is coming mm -hmm. from what you get through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. So that's... The, I think universally safe and effective means of evangelization. Yeah, so um, about, I think it was 15 years ago, you wrote your first book. Was it Salvation from the Jews? Was that the first book? Yes, yeah, Salvation is from the Jews. Why I want to bring that up is I didn't know Roy at the time, but I picked that book up. Let me see if we have that here. I know we do. This book right here, Salvation from the Jews. Um, is from the Jews. Uh, Salvation is if from the Jews. If anyone Googles now, you have yeah, to get, gotta it, get it right. right yeah, you know? so, I'm on the beach reading it, and there's a comment in there, and you said, well, and I, it, it may be a little bit off, something to the effect, you can't unJew a Jew. Once you're a Jew, you grew up in a tri from a tribe, and you follow in that tribe. So now you're dealing, why, why do I bring that up? You're dealing with family issues now. As you're growing up, you become this Catholic, and now you have a mother and a father and family members who are probably... Let me back up. First of all, let me back up. I, I certainly never said you can't undo... Yeah. A Jew, whatever that no, means. I, well, I, I kind of use my own words. I'm Jew, a Jew. You, you are. No, it's it's, it's much more than that. Okay. Um, and then I better get back to my witness testimony at some point because people will wonder, yeah, especially the go? Protestants, why you know, God forbid, why the Catholic right, Church right, is right. you know not real Christianity and so forth. But um, uh, basically, if anybody wants to know why you can't undo being a Jew, so to speak. Uh, one place to go is Romans chapter 11. St. Paul makes it very clear. This is St. Paul. This is St. Paul on his missionary journey. This is St. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, saying, I myself am an Israelite, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, he's using the present tense. He makes it very clear. He is still a Jew. And then he goes on to, to actually say explicitly, that the church is composed of Jew and Gentile, and the church will be composed of Jew and Gentile until the second coming. And he uses the uh, simile of the olive tree, the olive tree of salvation. Um, the, the tree was already, was originally planted in Judaism. The trunk is Judaism. The original branches of that cultivated olive tree were the Jews, but some of those branches were broken off in order to make room to graft on wild olive branches no offense meant, but St. Paul, those are the Gentiles. If you're one of the grafted in wild olive branches, don't boast over the broken off cultivated olive branches. Remember, if you do boast, first of all, that they were only broken off to make room for you. And secondly, that God has the power to graft them in again. And when he does, they'll be even better suited to the tree because they were an original part of it. Mm. And, and then he goes on to make it clear. He actually says, uh, I think it's verse 25, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, brethren, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of the Jewish people until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and then all Israel will be saved. So the picture is that, um, sure, some of those original branches were broken off to make room for the wild olive branches, but God, near the end of time, near the time of the second coming, will graft those broken off, cultivated olive branches back into the tree, They'll be even better suited to the tree. And then the olive tree of salvation, that's the church, composed of Jew and Gentile, will be ready for the second coming. For our Catholic listeners, again, going to the catechism of the Catholic Church, you remember what it says in paragraph 674, Of course don't you? I do. But <laughs> six, paragraph 674 says, quote, The glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. The second coming can't happen until a widespread conversion of the Jews. I'll just repeat that, uh, that uh, um, uh, whatever you call it, number. I don't want to say verse, that yeah. number of the catechism. Mm. 
the glorious Messiah's coming, that is the return of Jesus in glory, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history. So you have this picture of like Jesus up there just dying to come back, right? Waiting to come back. He's suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel, until the conversion of the Jews. Mm. So there's still a meaningfulness to Jewish identity. Sure. Jewish identity is not, it is a, a being a member of a tribe, but it's not about being a member of a tribe. It's about being the inheritor of the promise that God made to Abraham and his descendants forever, um, which uh, it gets complicated. That's why people might want to read my book, Salvation mm. is from the Jews. I also, by the way, have um, a website, salvationisfromthejews.com. I have lots of talks and videos on that. I have a YouTube channel, so I can go into this all in more depth in sure. various talks. But um, uh, where was I? We were talking about you becoming a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but I mean more immediately. Un, uh, uh, Jew becoming a, uh, um, you can't un-Jew a Jew is what no, I was going I with that. It was yeah. more recently, so I, I, I lost the thread, so, so I'll, I'll, um, well, let's I'll get back. Yeah, we'll go back to your conversion so we can convince people that what happened to you was a, an amazing, um, miraculous moment. Uh, boy, I wish I, I remembered. I really wanted to say whatever it was I was saying. Anyway. Um, Okay, back to the beach. There we back go. Back to, back that to experience. the beach. Sorry to take you off. Um, I, you know, I went home after that experience. The, the state of consciousness faded over a few hours. And um, I fell back into not seeing into the spiritual world, you know, in, in not having that um, uh, intimate communion with God and so mm -hmm. forth. But I went back home happy like I'd never been before. I knew there was never any reason to worry about anything. I knew that the absolutely all-powerful God who controlled absolutely everything that ever happened to me was controlling everything so it was the best possible thing that could, um, that could come to meet me, so to speak, that, that, that could um, come to me. So there was never any reason to be anxious about anything. I knew that here I had been so worried about not being loved when I was loved more than I could ever hope for. I knew that uh, not only did life have a meaning, but it had this infinite, eternal meaning, and so forth and so on. I mean, it was absolutely the, the best possible news in the world. Now, Christians know most of those things in principle. Jews don't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if anyone has a Jewish friend, uh, and I hope you do. I have tons. Uh, ask them what happens after you die. Yeah. And uh, chances are their answer will be... I don't know. Nobody knows for sure. Um, if they're a good Jew, the answer will be, you know, I don't know. Nobody knows, but God will be fair to us. That's kind of the answer in, in, in Job. Um, the, uh, um, if, if they're a modern Jew, there is, there is a, I think it's a poisonous book, but it was like an absolute New York Times bestseller by a rabbi named Harold Kushner called um, something like uh, What to Tell Your Children About God. And in it he says that it's a meaningless question, what happens after you die. That's like saying when you turn off the light switch, what happens to the light? Mm. It's just gone. It's not there. This is a rabbi telling parents what to tell your children. So um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, Christians should be grateful for knowing the answers to these questions. And um, Catholics have probably a more authoritative, if I can say so, obviously I think more correct, and certainly more exhaustive and complete answer to all of these questions. I had none of that. So imagine my joy when I found out it's all true, that we live forever, that divine providence is sovereign over everything, and so forth. I mean, I was just walking on air. I returned to Harvard Business School, so to speak, with no interest at all in teaching Harvard MBAs how to make a little more money. All I wanted to do was pursue this experience, find out who this God was, because I did not know in that experience who he was, what his name was, what religion it was. I could not think of it as Judaism. The picture of God in the Old Testament was not of this incredibly intimate personal God. So all I could do was every night before going to sleep say a short prayer that I had made up to know the name of my Lord and God and Master who had revealed himself to me that day. And a year after that first experience, 
I went to sleep after having said that prayer. And um, it was actually a year to the day after the first experience, the anniversary of it, because I had said a prayer of Thanksgiving also before going to sleep. And I thought I was woken by a hand on my shoulder and led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could imagine. I now know, by the way, that um, if there had been a, a video camera in the room, it would show me asleep in bed, that my body was still asleep in bed. I had no awareness of that at the time. I thought I was awake. I felt completely awake. My memory represents it as though I was awake and so forth. So I, I describe it as I experienced it, was a, which is as though I were awake. I was left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine, just to be in her presence and to feel the purity and intensity of the love that flowed from her was to be lifted up into a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist. I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. I asked her about five or six or seven questions, which she graciously answered. Then she said she wanted to talk to me about something. She spoke for another 10 or 15 minutes. Then the audience was ended. I went back to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, uh, I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. I must say I was hopelessly in love with her, which was uh, inevitable just to feel the love that flowed from her was to become hopelessly enamored of her. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. Uh, some of the questions, in some of the questions and answers, um, I learned more about who the Blessed Virgin Mary was. And uh, I, I knew, of course, I was never stupid that if this was the Blessed Virgin Mary, it had been Christ in the first experience. Mm -hmm. So when I woke up the next morning, I um, just wanted to be as fully and completely a Christian as possible. Mm. I didn't know the difference between a Protestant and a Catholic. All I could do was open the local phone book and, and start going to a local church, which is a Protestant church. But I knew who the Blessed Virgin Mary was, and that led me, without too many detours, into the heart of the Catholic Church. So there you have it. Wow. So I'm sure it's a lot more in-depth, and we can watch more of your videos and read the book, basically. Well, the book, the book is theology. Mm -hmm. uh, so my witness testimony in the book is no longer than it's been on the show. Right. Um, I didn't want the book to be about me. I wanted it to be, to be about the role of Judaism in salvation sure. history. Um, but I have YouTube videos of uh, witness testimonies, actually one. Uh, the, the, the Latin Americans are much more patient than us gringos. Yeah. I was speaking in Mexico, and I think it was three hours sure. to witness testimony video from right. the Mexican talk. But uh, in any case, they're, they're longer versions, 90-minute mm. versions on uh, YouTube and so forth. So, guys, we're a new Catholic TV show, as you know, um, and we, we're trying to keep everything within its time limit. And his story is it's much bigger and broader. If you kind of dig him up on YouTube you're going to want to hear more about this and what happened in his life because I followed from one YouTube video to the next, to the next, to the next. And a couple little um, miraculous little moments or God incidents, I like to call them. After I met you, people from everywhere have been reaching out to me saying, have you heard of this guy, Roy Showman? I don't want to say Schumann, Roy Showman. Um, and I'm like, yeah, as a matter of fact, I have. But everybody's watching your uh, YouTube videos and they're reading your books, and there's, it's, it's a, a bigger story than what we're doing here today, but I wanted to put him on because I like to have each show have a little bit about people having a uh, conversion to the Catholic faith, whether they're a Jew or a Methodist or an Episcopalian. As you know, we had Father Dave, who was an Episcopalian. Um, anything you want to say out there to people to keep their eyes open for to find God if they don't know God personally? Is there anything that you would suggest to people in the audience to say, like, hey, you know, pray this or do this or to put something in a place where they could find what it is that you found. If, if, they're, um, if they're Christians or if they're, if they're atheists, I like those other prayers. Yeah. Like I said, like Charles de Foucault, God, if you exist, I want to know, I have to know. Um, if they're Christians, then you already know a lot about how God wants you to live your life. And it's kind of a principle that if you don't follow what he's told you publicly, he's unlikely to go too far in telling you things privately. In other mm. words, the first step is to basically turn away from sin. And I think that um, if, if, if someone's a Catholic, um, we know what that means. It means, uh, you know, stop sinning, go to confession, uh, uh, um, 
indulge in the sacraments, right. you know, uh, follow the sacraments and so forth, follow right. the rules of the church. If it's a Protestant, follow what Jesus tells you to do in the New Testament and ask to know him more deeply. And uh, if, if you pray that from your heart, the God's in the business of responding. Yeah, God will reveal himself. Um, so again, guys, Catholic Shepherd, what we do here is we inspire, we evangelize, and we hopefully want you to get excited about the Catholic faith again, uh, or for the first time. So uh, I want to say a huge, huge thank you for you coming Thanks. on here today. You thank made you. my day. I am super grateful to uh, have you here. And I wish you the best on all your endeavors and uh, keep inspiring everybody. Like I said, guys, make sure you reach out um, on YouTube. Look at what Roy... Spell my name so they can find me on YouTube. S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N? They're not going to find me on YouTube if they, if they leave out one of those letters. You're right, so, so yes. make sure. So tell the camera, yeah, exactly um, where you want them to well, find you. Uh, S-C-H-O-E-M-A-N. That correctly, okay. That's right. Uh, Roy Showman, and if, whether you look on YouTube or Google or for my website or whatever, yeah. if you spell my name right, you're likely to find it. Yeah, please do. And guys, make sure you tune in to our next uh, episode. This was a little bit longer. Our, our typical show is a half hour. Guys, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you guys very soon. Thank you again. God bless you all.